Welcome to Go on the Run. And today, we're going to be starting section 24, security. But I want to emphasize that I'm going to try and take a simplified approach to telling you what I know. I also want you to be aware that I am not a security expert. I did not go to school for security, blah, 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 blah. Everything I know, I've sort of picked up here and there, taught myself, but nothing certified. I'm not certified in any part of security whatsoever. So um, if you find yourself having to do anything like implement an application or have to do anything with digital security and you are not an expert and trained or certified in this area, you should certainly seek help and find the right set of people. With that said, though, we're still going to be covering um, security because even though we're not expert, it doesn't mean that we still can't get a grasp of what it's about. With that in mind, um, let's figure out what's our objective or my objective in doing this, um, in tackling this subject, right? Um, I'm gonna take a bottom-up approach to understanding the basics. Um, I can, will not cover everything. I cannot cover anything, everything. And that's simply impossible by any measure of your imagination, right? Um, for what we're doing now, in terms of objectives, we're gonna focus, or I'm gonna focus on illustration of concepts over theory. That means that though I'm going to try and get you to understand how something might work or what possibly works and not delve into the um, documentation or implementation guide or anything like that or the research paper about how it's supposed to work, right? Because we're not trying to implement it. We're just trying to understand it. So it makes sense for us to simplify it as much as possible. Um, I'm going to try and keep it simple. I'm going to use the KISS principle. Um, so that falls in line with focus on illustration of the concept over theory. And we're going to try and cover enough to understand the basics, but not too much to be overwhelmed. I don't want to be overwhelmed. I don't want to overwhelm you. This can be a long, long, long topic. So what are some of the possible things we're going to be touching on? Well, when we talk about security, we definitely, in terms of digital security, we're going to be talking about encryption, how to encrypt or hide information in such a way that it's very difficult for unintended eyes to not know what it is. And that's going to touch, when we talk about security, we eventually at some point going to talk about asymmetric versus symmetric encryption. And the means we will at some point have to touch on TLS slash SSL. Um, we can also talk about public key infrastructure, um, PKI. And again, what that is, how it's sort of used. Um, Touching on these areas, um, when we talk about TLS and public key, we have to deal with digital signatures or message digest. So that's going to be something that we're going to be able to touch on. We're going to also touch on compression, even though that's really not about security, but I see it as sort of related. So um, we should sort of understand it and be able to differentiate it when somebody said they have some data that's compressed versus some data that's encrypted or secure. Um, encoding. We're also going to be talking about authorization versus authentication. If we're going to be talking about security, we have to be able to differentiate between people being authorized to do things or people being authenticated and people being authorized to do things. So we're going to figure out what that is. All right. Um, so in this very first part, I want to talk about, like I said, I'm doing, taking a bottom-up approach, bottom approach. So let's talk about zeros and ones. And why are we doing this? Why are we starting off with like zeros and ones? And because I think it's sort of fundamental to having a simplified understanding of security or an intuitive feel of what's going on. I said that we're going to be starting off with zeros and ones. And what I mean is we're going to start off by understanding binary numbers. And so to understand binary numbers and the possible operations on them, even if you know some of this before, just let's assume that oh, we're going to get on the safe, same page. And so let's just go over them anyway. And so in a binary system, we have two values. And those two values are just 0 and 1, nothing else. And the operation that we can perform on these values, right? We can perform like the NOT operation. And we'll see exactly what NOT is. If this is new to you, don't worry. I'm telling you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to show it to you. We are gonna we can perform the AND operation. We can perform the OR operation. We can perform the exclusive OR. We can perform NAND, which is more like a NOT and the AND operation. 
and a Nora, which is again a nut or or but we're not going to talk about the last two because as you can see there was a combination of the first three and so if you understand the first three then it's easy to understand those last two the only reason i put them there is that you might come across not in this course but you might come across things like a nor gate or a nan gate or something like that and then you'd know sort of like what is happening there okay so let's talk about a any binary operation right now the binary operation i'm talking about here is using the binary values that's what i mean by a binary operation i do not mean a operation that takes two upper end we're going to get to that later this is going to be a little bit confusing but just trust me for now let's just talk about the binary numbers or the values right and so we have a value it's a binary value and we're going to call that our input we're going to send that value to something which we're going to call a gate Again, even if you're not electrical engineer, don't worry that I'm using the word gate, but I like the word gate, so I'm going to use the word gate. We're going to send it to a gate. What is a gate? Just think of it as a device that can perform a certain operation. And then that device, once you send a value, it performs the operation, it produces a result. So that's what a binary operation look like. Input, some sort of gate that performs an operation, you get some results out. That's it. Just want to keep that picture in mind. Okay, with that in mind, now let's look at the NOT operation. Remember I said there are several operations, I went over them just now, for them really, NOT, AND, OR, exclusive OR. We're going to ignore the last two, NAND and NOR. nor. So what does the NOT operation look like? Again, we have a value, which is a binary value, in this case it's zero, because remember in a binary system we only have two possible values, zeros or one, right? So Let's say our input is zero and we send this to our gate. The gate we have and the gate we're working with now is a NOT gate. Then what should our output be? In this case, our output is going to be one. This is what the NOT gate does. It inverts your input, right? But since there's only one other possible value, because in the system you only have zeros and one, then if you give it zeros, you must get one by definition. That's the only other possible values if it's going to invert it. So that's the NOT operation. Um, another NOT operation is if you provide the value input value 1. Well, we know what that's going to be. Again, it's inverting the value, so you're going to get 0. All right, straightforward. So if we were to summarize the NOT operation, we might say it's something like this. When you your input is 0, and let's say you're using this symbol, this little carrot thing, to represent NOT operation, your output is 1. And so you might write this as an equation by saying carrot 0 will apply the carrot operation to the binary value 0, and your result is going to be 1. Or apply the, binary, the carrot to the binary value 1, and your output is 0. You might also see this represented in a much simpler table like this. Somebody didn't say, oh, this is the NOT, the true table for NOT. And this is what it looked like. You know, input is zero, output is one, blah, blah, blah. And you're supposed to know that, oh, this is not because, you know, it's going to say not table and input is zero, output is one. Straightforward, right? Much more simplified than the one up here with four columns. So let's talk about the AND operation. I want you to take note of what is different between AND and the NOT operation. For the AND operation, the only thing that has changed is that my input now is two values. It's still binary values, but I separate them by comma to say how I'm given two different binary values. And I'm going to feed that to the gate, which instead of being a NOT gate, is an AND gate, which makes sense because we're doing a different operation, so we're using a different gate. But we still have um, our output. Okay, so let's look at how this gate, the AND gate operates. So remember I said that I'm feeding it binary values as input too in this case. And so I feed it the binary value zero and another binary value zero. So that's two binary values. And I send that to my AND gate. What should my output be? Well, for the AND gate, when it sees two binary zero values, it produces an output of zero. Now again, remember this is very low level stuff. This is talking about bits. And that's another name, by the way, for a binary value is to simply call it a bit. Um, when you have a bit, 
you can represent one of two possible binary values, which is the zero and one we've been talking about. All right. The other possibility is that we might present our gate with the binary value zero and another value of one. So you can think of our gate as, as, in, as having two inputs, input one and input two, and input one is zero, input two is one. And so now the question is, what it will the gate spit out? And it will spit out zero. So anytime our gate sees zero and, zero and zero, it spits out zero. If it sees zero and one, it spits out zero also. And similarly, if we were to change things where we, our first input is a one, our second input is a zero, our gate will still spit out, spit out a zero or produce a zero value, right? Compute a zero value. Finally, we can then specify one and one, which is both inputs are one and our gate or AND gate will spit out a one. So if you can't keep all that in your head, don't worry, because we can summarize the AND gate by saying that it has this sort of relationship. If you give it the input A and B, and this is the symbol for AND, and this is gonna vary among programming language, but I'm using the, the symbols we'll use in Go. And now you can write an equation that says A and B is equals to C. So we can say if our input A is zero, input B is zero, and we perform the AND operation on the, those two inputs, our output is zero. And we can write that like this. And you can see that though, anytime any one of our input has a zero, and you're doing an AND operation, your output is going to be zero. The only time you get a one as the output from an AND gate is when you give it two ones. And of course, we can write that even much more simpler table that I mentioned before, which just sort of look like this is called a truth table. All right, so our OR operation, and again, our OR operation looks very much like our and set up in the sense that we have two values that we're going to be able to provide to our gate. This is very different than our not. Not take only took only one value. Whereas these other gates, the and on or gate, you can provide it with two values. And so this is an or gate. And let's see how it works. So if we step through how the or gate works, we can say, what if we provide two values that are both zeros? to our OR gate. Well, what is the output? And the output is zero. If we now change it and say, well, the first input is zero, the second input is one. What is the output? And that is a one. And you can see already, if you don't remember how the AND operate um, would have done it, would have done in this case, the AND would have given us a zero because for the AND gate, anytime any one of the input is zero, the output is always zero. But the OR gate, if we get a one on you know any one of the input, we also get a one on the output. And here's an example of that, is that notice how the first input now is one, the second one is zero, and then we get a one as the output. Finally, for our OR gate, if both inputs are one, we get a one as the output. So we can see that the OR gate then, if we try to summarize it, says that if we have inputs A and B, and this is the symbol for bitwise OR operation, then we can get A or B is equals to C, and this is what it looks like, is zero and zero as our two inputs, when we do the OR operation, we get zero, but if any one of our input is one, we get A1. Now, this might seem like a lot to remember, but if this is new to you, we're going to just use Go to do all this computation for us. So Go has these operators built in and we're just gonna use them. And we can validate that it's right, but we know it's gonna be right. <laughs> They're not gonna ship something like that doesn't work correctly. And there's this simplified diagram. So stick with me, we have one last operator to go through, and that is the exclusive OR operator. Exclusive OR, again, look very much like our AND or OR operator. The only thing that we change in here is the gate that's doing the operation, our input looks very much the same, two values. So if we step through what that looks like, again, we're gonna start off with, what if we were to present it with two zero binary zero values, two of them, what would the org gear produce? And it would produce a zero. Again, this look, hey, this looks sort of like and on or in this case. Well, if you produce or you, you provide the org gate 
with a zero and a one, the first input being a zero, the second one being a one, the output is a one. Well, interesting. This is where it looks similar to an or, right? Let's look at the next case. What about if you provide the OR gate with an input of 1 and 0? The first input is now 1, the second one is 0. What is the output? And the output is again 1. As you might suspect now, there's something going to be different because between OR and exclusive OR, otherwise so that we wouldn't have a second, um, we wouldn't have a need for a separate gate. And here it is. With the OR gate, if you provide a 1 and a 1, that would produce a 1 for the OR gate. But for the exclusive OR, a 1 and a 1 produces a 0 as the output. So let's summarize. For the exclusive OR, we have this caret symbol which we use as a unary operator for NOT. But notice how we're using it here. It's an infix, right? It's between the two values, the operands. And so it's a binary operator, but it's... Um, it's a binary operator in the sense of the pure mathematical sense that it's an operator takes two operands, but it's a binary operator or a bitwise operator because it works on binary numbers, right? So in that way, um, the term is overloaded here. But don't think about that. Let's just go and it uses the same symbol for not as it's using for exclusive or. And the only difference is whether you use it on a, with a one operand versus two. And so if we have inputs A and B, and we're using the exclusive OR operator, then if both inputs are zero, we get zero. If either one of the inputs are, if the two inputs are different, if they're different, we get a one. If the two inputs are the same, you get zero. So that's the easiest way to understand the exclusive OR operator, is if the two inputs are identical, it gives you a zero. If they are different, it gives you a one. And this is comes in handy not only for doing um, what we want, we're talking about, which is security and a good part of security is encryption, but also being able to quickly figure out if bits have been flipped and so on. So let's write our simplified true table. And it looks like this, right? If the two inputs are different, you get one. If they're the same, you get zero. Uh, now that's it for the operators. Now, before we can move on, we sort of have to understand something, bits and bytes. So I said that in a binary system, we have two values. Those two values, possible values, you can use a bit to represent one of those values, right? If you have a bit, think of a bit as the thing that allows you to say whether it's a zero or a one. That's a bit. So a bit can only take on one of those two possible values. Now we can group bits to represent even larger values. And you can see how this is done. So we can say, for example, take four bits, group them together, and we call them a nibble. We can then be able to represent values between 0 to 15. Because remember, with one bit, we can represent value 0 and 1, right? Two possible states. So with four bits, we can represent up to 16 possible states. But we start counting from 0, so we say 0 to 15. So when we group eight bits together, we get a byte. Now, with 8 bits, we can represent a value between 0 to 255. And as you can see, as you group bits, you can represent more and more possible values. A trick is that each bit allows you to represent twice as many values. And you're going to see that a little bit just now. And so you can keep going on and on. Um, you can group, you know, 16 bits and call it a word, for example, and so on. And then after then, people can agree on what to call it, maybe a Q word and so on for 8 bits, but whatever. Uh, it doesn't really matter at this point. Just note that you can group bits to represent more and more values. Okay. So we talk about this idea of one bit and a bit being able to carry one or two possible of these binary values. So if I have one bit, I can either say that my bit has the value zero or my bit has the value one. And in decimal, if I'm using binary, the equivalent in decimal is just zero and one. And so the way I'd like you to think of a bit is to say that when the bit has the value zero, it's as if I have a light, one light bulb, and it's off. And when the bit has carries the value one, it's as if my light bulb is on. That's how I'd like you to think of it. And if you can do that, then we can see that if I have two bits, then it's equivalent to me having two light bulbs. And so I can say when my two bits are carrying the value zero, both of my light bulbs are off. 
when one the um, bit on the right is carrying a one, it's equivalent to my light bulb on the right being on. And of course, things can flip because I have two bulbs, right? When it's one zero, that's equivalent to my bulb on the left being on and my bulb on the right being off. Or it could be that both bulbs are on. And notice that by simply adding one bit, we have doubled the number of values we can represent. Before, we could only represent two possible values of one bit. We added a second bit, so we group in two bits together. And notice now we can represent four things. So zero to three, but it's still four possible values. And so we have doubled the values we can um, represent. And this is the case every time you add one bit. So let's try this again. So if I have three bits, I'm not going to put on the whole light bulb. It gets a little bit crazy at that point. But keep that in mind. Like everywhere you see a zero, think of a light bulb being off. And everywhere you see one, think of a light bulb being on. And you can see with one more bit, now we've gone from two bits to seven to three bits. Now we have double our space going from zero to three to now zero to seven, which is the same as going from one to eight. So we have eight possible values. Now let the last one. Let's look at four bits, which we call a nibble. And with four bits, you can see that oh, we go from zero to seven, which is what we had when we had three bits. And the thing to note is when we add a new bit, look at this in front. The bit in front is zero. The, bit, the last three million bits still do what they were doing before. But now when we make this leftmost bit one or the most significant bit, then you can see that, oh, well, that has been one. These other bit, the last three bits remain um, toggled the same way. Now, if this doesn't make sense to you, think about how you come from with decimal. You start at zero, one, two, three, all the way up to nine. And when you get to nine, what? So decimal means 10, deci, 10, right? So there are 10 digits that you can use. Well, once you get to 10, you start off back with zero. This keep just repeating. So you start back with, with zero and one. So zero, one, two, you can see that behind here. But notice what you put in front. You put this number next. And then when you reach 19, you start off again with zero and then you use this and say two, zero, 20. So it's the exact same thing with binary number. You start off with zero, one, and when you finish that, you toggle again, zero, one, zero, one, which is the exact same thing you would do if you were to write out a bunch of decimal number. You'd see zero through nine being repeated over and over. And then the number in the next place would sort of take on, you know, be toggling also. So you can see that the first number, the first time we did zero and one, all these are zero. Then the next number here become one and we toggle it. And then we repeat the process again. We repeat this part now with this being one, and then when we exhausted that, we made this one and repeat. If what I said doesn't seem to make sense, don't worry about it. There's a number of ways to um, understand binary numbers, and hopefully this just give you um, a little peek into, peek into what they are. Like I said, I've covered this material in my Golang course and my Udemy course, so I'll put the videos to those. All right. So when you can group binary um, bits together, you can then, like I said, you can represent things. So for example, let's focus on this column, the third column. And you can see here's our bits again. Zero and one, you have one bit, blah, blah. Now the, part, the way they build this table is instead of using the same number of bits or showing you the same number of bits, um, they just simplify it and just use the bits, um, the least number of bits that they need. And so here, to represent the decimal value zero, they needed only one bit. To represent the decimal value one, they still only needed one bit, right? Because with one bit, we can do zero or one. Now, when it comes to representing the decimal value two, they needed two bits. And so now they, they wrote down that they need two bits. And so we have one zero to represent the decimal value two and one one to represent the decimal value three. And you can see you just keep going down and we've covered this already. We've shown that the decimal, the decimal value seven is really requires three binary bits and they and that's when they're all one 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 now in the middle there's this thing called hexadecimal which is yet another numbering system so you have the binary number system numbering system you have hexadecimal numbering system and you have decimal notice in decimal you use zero through nine then it repeats in binary you use zero and one only and then it repeats in hexadecimal you use zero through f so once you get to 10, you can't use that because decimal. So you use A to represent 10, B, and so on. 
and F for 15. So that's your 16th digit. And then now it repeats, right? And so what hexadecimal allows you to do is to make, to represent very large number in a little space. So this is not gonna make much sense until you jump all the way to the end there. You can see the decimal value 127 requires three places or three digits, whereas in hexadecimal it only require two. And so you'll see memory addresses and so on, and a lot of large value being expressed in hexadecimal. But we're not here to learn hexadecimal. It's very straightforward and easy to convert between binary and hexadecimal. It's, but we're not gonna cover it here. Octal is yet another numbering system. And there octal, the word octal means like octagon, um, octopus, eight. So zero to seven is the highest value. And then notice how it repeats, right? Okay, so these first four columns represents your numbering system, different numbering system, but they're just the values that you can represent. What do those values mean to the computer? So this is an ASCII table. And so it's telling you that oh, if the computer encounters or is given the zero, uh, zero, right? It thinks of that as a null character. The character is the thing that a computer operates on, right? You can think of it that way. It really appears on binary values, but those binary values represent a character, right? So it's sort of circular. And so this is sort of from the days of teletype, right? Like not typewriters, but how do you send information about going to another line, tabbing over, backspacing, deleting, and all these other stuff, acknowledging, end of transmission. So you could think of it um, as modem communication, right? Cancel, end of medium, all this other stuff, escape, right? So file separation, all these things. These are the control characters that they have in square bracket. You could see space over there, right? That's like white space. You know, we sometimes say white space meaning a space or a tab, right? Like horizontal tab mostly we use, we don't use vertical tab but on also backspace, right? But look at the first printable character. These you can't really see. You can't see, yeah, you can see a space, but on a tab, but they're considered non-printable characters. And the printable characters start from here. And you can see it's a bang, double quotes it look like over there, and hash, dollar sign, percent, ampersand, single quotes, and blah, blah, blah. And you know, you can really make them out, but whatever they are, it doesn't matter. But these are the binary, if you type, if I type dollar sign on my computer right now, what my computer really or stores that at or represents it in memory is like this, 100, 100. That's what it represents that um, in binary. Of course, 100, 100 in binary is just 36 decimal. So if you look down this ASCII table, you'll see it all. Those are the numbers over there. Remember, the decimal number used to represent the character number are two different things. So the decimal number 10 is used to represent line feed, the character, but the character, the decimal number 57 is used to represent the character nine. When you type nine on your computer, what you're really typing is this decimal value 57, which in binary is this 111001. You don't really have to memorize these and we, you, I'll show you how you can easily see it in Go. But there they are, the numbers and then some more special characters. And then we go into the uppercase character, a few more special characters, and then lowercase characters, followed by a few more special characters. And then there's one control character here, delete, okay? Now, you might have heard me say, or remember, if you remember, I said that oh, um, we usually in the computer world talk about bytes, which are eight bits, but here they're clearly using seven bits. That's because this is an ASCII table. So they only need seven bits to represent all the letters and characters and symbols that you and I in the Western world use. But there are other characters, if you use a 256, um, 55, uh, 256 um, or eight bits binary value, and that gives you 256 possible values. There are other characters, but those are more like decorations, right? Um, angles and so on. But then what if you want to represent Chinese character or, um, you know, Sanskrit or something, other language that is not um, Western like English and so on. Well, there you need to have many more bits and that is where UTF encoding comes in. And we're not gonna talk about it. All you need to know is to represent those other characters or symbols, you need a lot of other, you need more bits. So you need 16 bits, sometimes you need up to 32. 
So that's it for binary numbers. So let's jump into some code and do a little bit of playing around before this video gets even longer. So here I am at my command line. I'm in our security directory, it's empty. So I'm gonna make a directory for part one and I'll call it zeros and ones. And I'll start my visual code editor. We'll of course start with exercise one, which is going to be a new folder. We call it exercise one. But of course we should put in our directory here a go mod file. So let's call it go mod and we're doing module, let's call it security, SEC for short. And let that save, we close this and we go back to our exercise directory. And just to get in the habit, we'll create a subdirectory called command and then we'll create a file for main.go. Now, what should the first thing be that we want to do? Well, let's just get comfortable with the idea of turning characters into their binary representation. So for that, we'll of course start with package main and we're going to start with a simple function main. And let's just say that we had a message and it had the value and this is a string, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? That's uh, a string. Now we can say it is a string of characters, which it is. And so what we can do then is, or we can simply write a character, something like this, batch as this, back, um, single quote, sorry, and we can say zero, that is a character. And we can print out our character by doing printf, and we can say, Let's print out this character v and or print out some value v and we can uh, let's go to a new line and we can say c for example is that and let's do c. Well, let me take this out for now. Maybe I just get rid of this for now. Let's just focus on one thing. And so I save this and if I were to run my program now and I'm going to right click and click run. If I were to run my program now, you'll see that though c gets the value 48, which is exactly what I showed you, is that the character zero has a different decimal value, which is 48. Now, if you would like to see this as a the binary value, we can also do this and use percent %b to mean um, the binary value. When we use percent %v, we're telling Go to use the best possible thing that it thinks can represent that type. And you can see here, our type is a rune. It's actually not a byte, but that's a little bit more go thing. And hopefully the videos that I'm gonna point you to will explain the difference between bytes, rune, and strings. So definitely check out that if you're still not clear. But anyway, if we run our code now, we'll see that how we have the decimal value 48, but this is what it looked like as a binary value. And now Go is not going to print out leading zeros because those are useless anyway. It's sort of like type in 0, 5. It still means 5, so why type 0 in front of it? At that point, you could, why stop at 1, 0? You could type a million zeros in front of 5, and it's still 5. So same thing with binary numbers. We don't need to type the lead in zeros. Okay, so now we know how to take a character and represent its binary values. But what if we had something like what I was started off with, and that is, okay, um, you know what? I will close this and just start my Visual Studio Code editor in the part one directory anyway, so that way I don't have to worry about trying to, when I copy things, how to, where to paste them. So I copy this and I can just paste down at the bottom here and I know it's always gonna put it in the right place and so exercise two. And so if we're dealing with exercise two, I was about to start with something called a message and let's call it a string of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, if we have a string, now we can loop over it and print out each character, right? So we can do four and I don't care about the index. All I care about is the value. Let's loop over message and let's do it this way. And so let's print out the value V and so we can do v comma v and so what this is going to give us is each v is a rune and that's because in go a string is utf encoded so 
each one of these is a room but you don't need to worry about that like i say we cover that in other videos so definitely check those out but a rune is very clever in that if it's a character that can be represented with eight bits only well that's how it's encoded if it needs to be a chinese character that it's um, encoded with 16 bits then it will do that too so you don't need to think about it and so if we were to run this now um let's right click run and we can see that oh let's just take out this new line so we don't have that there and let's put the new line down at the bottom put this here and let's clear up again clean up and run it and we can see that our c is 48 49 50 51 52 and we can see the binary values are going up the same way right the first part here you can see it's all the same and then the last part is all zero then one then one zero just like we were then one one just like we would expect for binary values um well i don't like oh it's printing this out like this so i'd rather print out the character followed by their binary equivalent so let me change how we're printing this out so um let me copy this make another example real quick let's do this colors example three and just to make sure that we're modifying the right thing let me close all those and so what i'll do is i'll copy this because i need to print out two things right i want to print out not the character but rather the character yes the visible character so i will use um c to say that oh i don't want the value the numeric value but i want the character itself and i'll put a space like this and then I'll print a new line and then below it I'll loop around and print out the binary value does it make sense so I want it to go across the screen and then below it's so two lines so let me show you what I mean so if I run clean up or clear out run again so this is what I want but of course I want this to be like this and so let's run again because otherwise it'll just look at string as ones and zeros um, my thing did not save I run it before it was saved and there we go. So now this is the binary representation for the character zero. Well, I can make this a lot better by saying, well, since this is binary value and it looks like it's taken up six spaces, I can insert six here and six here. And if I save it and I run again, now when I look like this, it's nicely lined up. Well, we can just go ahead and make it eight. Why not use eight? Give us a little bit more, some more space. All right, so, all right, looks pretty good. All right, so that's good. Um, so now that we can print out these binary values and uh, we see what the binary values are for each character, what we can do now is we can say, well, why don't we perform some operation that we learned earlier on those binary values so what if we change this uh, let's copy our example paste it again we'll say we have example four and so why don't we change this from just simply a numbers to something like hello make it a little bit more interesting and of course if we were to run this well we know that we'll get the same thing we should see h and the representation for those guys and that's fine okay but what we want to do now is try using the operations that we learned so the not operations and so on so for that um so let me just i change that so let me yeah let's use the same example um let me copy and paste this set of lines here let's clear up the screen and what i want to do is i print out the character followed by its binary value and then I want to print out the not of it. So this is going to be the first example where we use the not operation. Okay, so let's do not operation. And so remember when we say not operation, that's a unary operation where you use the bang. Okay, and so this is a not on a room value. And so let's run it and see. 
And so here we go. We have like negative, and that's not exactly what I expected. But if you look, you'll see that each bit is flip, right? Because that's what we say. Well, not quite. Um, this is not what I really expected. This one seemed like it's flip. Here it's feeling like it's flip. But here you can see this is zero, this is zero. It's not flipped and then leaves lead and values. And the reason why is because we're iterating over this as a rune. What we really should do is save this as a slice of byte. So we want to say to go turn my string into a slice of byte, not a slice of rune. By default, when you iterate over a string in Go with a range operator, it treats it like a slice of rune. And we want it to be specifically a slice of bytes. So now if we clean up and rerun, we should get what we expect, which is for H, we know that this is the binary equivalent. But when we do the not, look at the opposite there. Look, each bit is flip. Each bit is flip. Remember I told you for the ASCII values, H, we're going to use seven bits. Well, the leading bit was zero. So that's why when we do the not operation, it's now one. And only now we need to print it because now that's significant, right? Uh, when it's zero, it's not that significant. So if you look at this, you can just eyeball it really quick and you will see it each and every single bit from the top one and below, it's flip, right? So that's the not operation. So let's copy this and let's paste it. And this is example five. And now let's call this our and operation. Bitwise and, I should call that bitwise and. Maybe yeah, that's going to make more sense. Bitwise, not operation. So let's close our thing here. Um, cancel, give it time to save, close. And so this is bitwise and. And for the and, what should we and this with? Well, let's just get a value. And we need a bit because you want to do a bitwise, well, byte. Well, we can do individual bits, but why? We can just do bytes, right? So we can just get a byte value. So let's say k is equal to some byte value. And we can convert um, some character to a byte. So let's just say v, for example. This is my byte value that I want to convert this character. I want to convert it to a byte. And so we can use the k ampersand. And it doesn't matter the order. Like we can say k ampersand v or v ampersand k. That doesn't matter because all you're doing is lining the bits up within each one of those value and taking doing the bitwise operation. And so what we should do then is put another line where we sort of spit out what two values we're ending. And so if we do that and we say there and maybe we pull this up above here. So that's our K value. And so we spit this out. And so this is K. It doesn't really matter. Um, we just need to range over that. We're not going to use it in any which way whatsoever. And we say K. Oh, it's so hard for me to type that. And so we write the binary value of k. And so if we, you know what makes this a lot easier to read, is if we would simply print out, like print f print f, and we say um, character, right? And maybe even if we do print f, we do percent s, and then we do 10, for example, comma, and we say corrector. And then we copy this down and we say call this um, binary. And then we copy this down. And here we give it one name, give it another name down the bottom here. Up. So here it would be k value and then result. Okay, that's the result. That's the end thing after we do our operation, right? So let's see if this has the look that I am going for. Clear that and 
that's not what I wanted. What, what, what was that I just did? I did run. Uh, there we go. So now this looks a little bit better. So we have here is the, the here are the characters on that first line. This is their binary representation. This is our k value, and this is going to be the same. We're not changing that. And so we're doing a bitwise and operation. So zero and one is zero. One and one is one. One and one is one. And so remember from and we get a one only when both inputs are one. And so this is going to represent input one, input two, and this is the value. And they're doing it bitwise, but we can specify a byte. And so Go is smart enough to take, or your computer writer is smart enough to be able to take care of those, but it's still doing it bitwise. And so that's what it looked like. And so you can see that here, when we end this just random value, I put V, but you can try anything. And this is just what the output is. And you can see all three of these happen to have the same output, even though they're different inputs here, but we, that's just how it worked out, right? No special meaning, just playing around right now. Let's grab this, copy it, and paste it. And this is going to be our example six. Let's call it or, and maybe we should call this like exemplify that and, um, example four that not i believe all right and so let's close these make sure we're working on the right example um, let's clear the screen here and so this is bitwise or and all we have to do is scroll down here and change this to the or operator bitwise or operator and we rerun We run it up here and there we go you can see again we get zeros only when both values are zero right otherwise still, we always get one same two values we're using but sort of different here we get all ones the result is all one just because it worked out that way all right not very interesting so far but trust me this is our foundation to security just trust me in that so get comfortable with the binary operations that we're doing, and then we'll see how it is used um, to get us started with security. So paste that, and this is exercise seven, and this is exclusive or. And we click on that, and we scroll down. I remember exclusive or operator, if it's doing not, it's like that. But then if you're doing exclusive or, it's like that and so let's run this and now we have of course different output all of them give us different output but it's the same thing as what we know for the exclusive or which is you get the zero when they are both the same so you can because these are both the same you get zero because they are both the same you get zero so you have two leading zeros but why type them out print them out if you actually want to see them what you can do is put, I think, like zero that um, 8B. And then that should, let's rerun that and see if that is going to put the lead in zeros. And yes, it does include the lead in zeros at that point. Um, but we should then do it for like all the other ones um, if we actually want to see it. But it uh, doesn't really matter. So you, you're free to put that in if you want. Uh, remove that, rerun our code. And so that is our exclusive or operation. So now we've played with bits, right? We've, we've said what a bit is. We look at grouping bits. We look at the operation you could perform on a bit. And then the operation you can perform on groups of bits using the bitwise operators in Go. And so this is exclusive or. And in the next video, I promise you, we're going to do a little baby layman simple cipher where we're going to be able to change some simple readable text into something that's not readable and that's what we're going to say we encrypt it we're going to say yeah we encrypt our thing because we can at that point think of using a key to change the text and if only if somebody has the exact key that we use only then they can uncover that information i will see that next week or in the next video so before we close let me give you some supplemental material just in case um, you want to look at this a little bit more closely or this is your first time or you need a refresher or something like that. So 
a while back I did my Go programming language um, for YouTube. Um, I did some um, videos on you know values, bits and numbers, and sort of went through some of the things that I showed you today. What is a bit, how to think about it, how you group bits. But then I went a little bit further and show you how you can then use bits, groups of bits to represent different types of values and you know strings and so on. Um, and so these two videos cover that piece of information. Um, then I did my Go language for Taurus and I developed a course specifically for you, Udemy. And as some of you who've been with me for a while know that I intend to post it and I promise I'll post it by the end of the year. I have some vacation time coming up and I'll be able to sit down and just start up upload the whole thing. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I've posted one lecture from that um, course and in that lecture, I didn't go into the whole bits and stuff, but um, what I did was I showed how a string and um, is built up of runes and um, show you how you can sort of understand what a rune is and a string. And then of course, it's gonna also talk about a byte, but I didn't go into the whole bits thing. So I think these three videos, if you watch them in this order, um, should give you a sort of better idea on, um, of how um, bits are used and so on. And it really doesn't have anything to do with what we're doing here with security, but it does help fill in some of the gaps, if there are any, about how bits and values are represented in a computer, and then specifically for string, since we'd be messing a lot with string in the same code and in our security thing, um, it certainly will help there. Okay, so that's it. This is also already a long video, so See you next time. Let me know if you have questions or comments or suggestions or anything of the sort, feedback, whatever. Um, of course, thumbs up the video, like it, share it, you know, hit that bell so you know, get notification. See you in the next video. Take care. Bye.